for the first and second chapter of spectrum so this is the third chapter which we are doing today we initiated with the introduction in the last class but i'll repeat that introduction for you again and I hope I'm live and it is working fine with you. In case there is any issue, please let me know in the comment section. Let me just check if it is working fine. And kindly give me a few seconds to check the technical part with the live team. Okay. Yes, it's working fine. Good evening guys, good evening everyone, how are you all doing? Okay. Yes. Hi Nikhil, uh, I hope guys you can see everything and it's working fine, right? Okay, so can we start? Yes. Okay, guys. So I hope you completed watching the last class in which we discussed the first and second chapter. The first chapter was about the sources to study the uh, modern Indian history, in which archives are very, very important for us. So we discussed about archives, which are written set of documents and their historical records. They are not something which were written to be uh, read in future and surveyed accordingly but they just used to maintain their official data and we can follow it as a source to study the modern indian history today other than archives we had many unofficial records and uh, poems travel accounts so many other things which we discussed in the second chapter we discussed about the major approaches in which colonial and nationalist approach was very very important and now we will discuss something about the arrival of europeans okay so first of all i want you to look at this map where two important locations are there constantinople which is istanbul today istanbul okay so at that time it was known as constantinople which came under the ottoman turk empire under the control of ottoman turks in 1453 so when 1453 date starts this is the date from where the blockage will start the blockage for the europeans to come to the eastern countries okay so that's why 1453 is an important date here one more important point which you need to remember is a clash between portugal and spain because they both wanted to be the superpower okay they were like big mafias of the world and they used to fight okay they had a clash that who will conquer more and more land so ultimately they had a treaty of tordesillas one more important point is here you can see on italy coast we had venice and there was one more coast geneva okay so venice and geneva these two coastal areas were there in italy but italy and the two most important coastal areas venice and geneva these uh, areas were not sufficient enough to handle the entire international trade and that's why britishers had to search a new sea route so we have so many muslim intermediaries here and these muslim intermediaries these islamic rulers don't want christianity to spread don't want christian world to spread they don't want europeans to win so it's a religious clash as well as a business clash okay so they had a religious zeal also and they had a profit making mindset also so that's why god glory and gold which we discussed in the last class right i hope it is clear fine so thank you so much nikhil thank you so much i can see that you guys are saying that the first lecture was awesome thank you nikhil and uh, that's great that you guys watched and loved it 
now we are starting with the second lecture so you need to discuss uh, one point in your mind and in your you know uh, notes also when you uh, make your notes and when you write the answer in the mains the worst one most important century here is 7th century do you know the significance of 7th century it's a very important time it's a very important time period why because two important things happened in 7th century first the fall of roman empire and second rise of islam okay so these two important events will change the history so 7th century is a very important time period okay so in the 7th century we had a decline of roman empire roman empire was also having the eastern extension which was known as byzantine empire but it also had a fall right and arabs now established their dominion everywhere in egypt in persia persia means iran okay so the part of egypt you see today the part of uh, arabia the part of iran it was under the muslim control okay islamic rulers used to rule there and muslim intermediaries they had to uh, you know focus on their own trade and things whatever was in exchange between east and west so these muslim intermediaries used to say that whatever is the route even if it is a land route or a sea route that is now in our control so europeans could not reach to india here you can see a very important route which is the route by red sea this is red sea and this is a route coming from baghdad okay to clarify this map more nicely we can refer to this one okay here you can see lisbon is the capital of portugal from where vasco da gama came and there are three important ports in the side of red sea aden ormuz okay and one more port is here in this particular part which is malacca okay and here you need to understand the relation between india and indonesia also because indonesia was a spice island okay and today as we are discussing the advent of europeans we'll discuss portuguese french dutch danes english okay and we'll see that all of them are fighting to get what to get monopoly okay so the fight is there for the monopoly they wanted to establish their own monopoly so aden ormuz malacca is very very important and here in this map you can see the location of baghdad through which you can reach to india right and this is red sea which is already discussed with you and then you, here you can see venice and geneva these two important coastal areas so italy italy here used to control a lot of trade a lot of exchange activities and when constantinople fell under the ottoman turk empire now muslims blocked all those existing routes the route by the red sea and baghdad and of course they had a ancient silk route also but it was now under the control of muslims so europeans whenever they need to buy anything they can only get it through the muslim intermediaries but they wanted to have a direct trade with india because they wanted to maximize their profit and that's why they started their new search to discover a new sea route and so many rulers as they wanted to have a dominance in the world they started sponsoring these ideas okay like today we have a government uh, and they say that okay start up india is good stand up india is good make in india is good and we will give you access to all the liberties if you want to start a business if you want to be an entrepreneur please go for it and government is supporting indians today so in this present situation you see that government is empowering citizens right so this was happening during the 7th century and after the industrial revolution in a very active way in the european nation okay so how it got started 1453 the date is very very important uh, from where the ottoman turks got the constantinople 
एंड नाउ अरब मुस्लिम इंटरमीडिएट इज स्टार्टेड कंट्रोलिंग एवरी थिंग सो वॉट हैपन वॉज दैट देर वॉज द एंड ऑफ डार्क एज बिकॉज डार्क एज वॉज अ डोमिनेंस ऑफ चर्च इट वॉज इन द मिडेबल टाइम इन यूरोप एंड देर वॉज अ फ्यूडल सिस्टम गोइंग ऑन सो बाय द टाइम ऑफ फोर्टीन सेंचुरी यूल सी दैट फ्यूडलिज्म विल डिक्लाइन एंड द डार्क एज विल ऑल्सो एंड why because people wanted to discover new things and that's why renaissance happened so 14th century was the end of dark age and starting period of renaissance but there is no one single date from where we can say that renaissance started from this date okay renaissance is a very important term here which you need to understand it means rebirth okay it was taken from a french word rebirth which means rebirth so renaissance is rebirth or the awakening it's a period where people started to think in a very different way in a very rational way so renaissance started in 15th century now the question is what is this renaissance okay uh, like generally if in a layman term you need to understand it just understand that when people got a very open mindset okay and they started thinking in a very human humanity perspective they got humanity in their mind rationality in their mind and they used to think about logics they never wanted to follow the old age superstitious traditions anymore because they wanted to know the answers like if church is asking us to come to you know church and uh, pay donations and pay pilgrimages then why should we do it is there any logic behind it is there any thing which is associated to it so people started questioning everything so it's a very long period of time these things don't happen in one day or two days and philosophers writers authors used to write about it support these ideas people started influencing by it okay so first of all renaissance happened and second is advance ship building okay this is again a very important point they had a very good quality of timber in europe so timber is very important to make ships so ship industry was very very advanced and there was an economic development also because they started focusing on agriculture they started focusing on trade and commerce they initiated with the primary activities and then secondary activity so they started all those things to ensure that economy is advanced now and to have a good economy they started focusing on crop rotation soil fertility and so many other things even the pluff was introduced uh, the you know iron pluff which was there uh, they had pluff shears before also but now they improved the pluffs they improved the metallurgy also and that's why they started ruling the world okay so europe is now coming out of feudalism coming out of dark age in the 15th century and that's why we'll try to control other parts of the world fine in the colonial approach if you remember we discussed few points okay if you remember we discussed what that they had a mindset of pax britannica means britishers should rule everywhere and the british paramount see can bring peace law and order to the world right so same is going to be there in their mind and it will be started by the portuguese now the question is why portuguese why portuguese came first can you tell me okay i am following the new edition okay uh, the question is that uh, if i am following the old edition no i am following the new edition and i am trying to connect the spectrum with other important standard books also for you so don't worry about it you will not miss any point okay just have faith this is a very important thing right you must have faith okay now let's understand that how the journey will be there we knew that two important mafias of world spain and portugal they had fight they started clashing to be super power so to ensure their superiority they started capturing different lands and resources but with their clash and fights 
on daily basis on regular basis they understood that it's just a waste of time for both of them and now they decided to have a treaty the treaty of tordesillas it was in 1497 okay when they decided to divide the non christian world by an imaginary line the imaginary line is going to be on the atlantic ocean so 1494 is a very important date please remember that this is a date of a very important treaty treaty of tordesillas okay as per this treaty they decided that portugal and spain will not fight anymore and they will divide the non christian world by an imaginary line in atlantic ocean so they initiated the process by 1497 okay this division and then going forward with this plan so now the non christian world is divided okay and this will be very helpful for vasco da gama that he would be able to ensure that there is no more fight so in 1498 vasco da gama vasco da gama will reach calicut okay vasco da gama will reach calicut so vasco da gama arrived with abdul majid abdul majid was a gujarati pilot who helped vasco da gama because see so many portuguese travelers before vasco da gama we had bartolomo diaz bartolomo diaz was able to reach till the part of southern most tip of africa but then after cape of good hope they had no clue but vasco da gama arrived with abdul majid at calicut and the ruler zemurin welcomed them that okay fine please come here vasco da gama when he came here initially he had a mindset to just see the things in india and get a right sea route and he just took few items spices silk cotton and all those commodities were now sold to europe when he went back to europe he got 60 times profit and then he decided to open trading factories so he opened three trading factories in kannanur in calicut and in cochin and then he started fortifying it so when he decided to fortify the factories he came in the clash with zemurin because zemurin was the local ruler vasco da gama also asked zemurin that you should not have any trading relations with this muslim intermediaries or arab muslim intermediaries because see arabs and europeans they both were enemies at that time so that's why they had a clash and that's why they never wanted to see each other but you must understand that europeans especially portuguese they were very much disciplined and organized they had better ships also cannons were placed on their ships and that's why they were able to win over arab muslim intermediary so when vasco da gama decided to fortify the centers in kannanur calicut and cochin he saw that zemurin is ready to fight and it will lead to a battle okay of course the battle will be there now the question is how this uh, you know thing is there that a company or a ruler uh, not a ruler but a traveler is there and is declaring a war or a battle against a ruler in india so this is just to get the profit in hand they were not interested in polity okay it's not the intention to acquire the land it is to get profit with monopoly so this is a fight for monopoly right fine okay yes now let's understand this that the time of 15th century is very very important because europe is now with the spirit of renaissance and that's why they started the exploration in the entire world okay prince henry 
ruler of Portugal. He got a nickname. Please tell me what was the nickname. I told you in the last class. In the comment section, you need to tell me. I want you guys to comment and ask doubts and interact with me in the live class. Right? Because we are doing it live. We could have uploaded the recordings for you, but it is live by. Because I want to interact with you. I want you guys to think, comment, and discuss things with me. Okay? So, do you remember the nickname? Yes. The nickname was Navigator. Exactly. So, Navigator was the nickname. Fine. So, you need to understand here that the journey of Portuguese is starting. And Vasco da Gama was the first Portuguese traveler who discovered the sea route to India in 1498. Okay. He went back with the Indian commodities, sold it, got a lot of profit and then came back again in India. So, now his second visit is in 1502. Okay, one by one, we need to understand it. One by one, we will understand this thing. We are talking about Vasco da Gama. Okay. So, in 1498, he discovered the sea route. Only discovery was there. So, in 1498, he came to Calicut, where the ruler Zemurin was there. And in 1502, he will establish factories. Okay. He will start trading stations at three areas. Calicut, Cochin and Kanna Road. Calicut, Cochin and Kanna Noor. Okay, very, very important. After him, Francisco de Almeida as a Portuguese governor will come to India. He will be there from 1505 to 1509. Francisco de Almeida is the first governor who initiated the blue water policy or Cartas system. Okay. Data system or blue water policy. Fine. I'll discuss in detail with you, but before going into the detail, I just want you to understand this timeline. Here you need to understand that there was one more Portuguese traveler, Pedro Alvarez Cabral, who was here from 1505, uh, 1500 to 1505, but his factories were destroyed. Okay. He was the one who established the first factory. But the factories was destroyed and attacked by the local, uh, you know, local men and of course the ruler. Why? Because uh, he wanted to have a very direct kind of trade and uh, a system where there are no Muslim intermediaries. So he came in clash with Arabs in a very direct way. So the period of his factories and the trade which he initiated was a very short-lived thing. He was not having any foresightness. But he was also a Portuguese traveler and he initiated the factory making in the Calicut only. He opened the first factory, but it was destroyed. That's why he is not important. Okay. His factories were destroyed. That's why he is not important for us. Now, Portuguese, when they understood that they are now able to open the factories and if they want to run a good business, they should send their governors for few years to consolidate the Portuguese trade in India. So, they sent the first governor as Francisco de Almeida. So, Francisco de Almeida, when he came here, he started the character system. After him, Alfonso de Albuquerque will come, who will again, you know, initiate more consolidation with the village administration. He will also abolish Sati system in India. And in 1510, he will get Goa from the Sultan of Bijapur, which is the most important achievement. Okay, so here you need to remember these few points for prelims that he is the real founder. Okay, who see the blue water policy was given by Francisco de Almeida and the character system, which the idea of character system was given by the Francisco de Almeida because he was the one who thought about the character system. But it was 
in really execution came during the rule of alfonso de albuquerque why because he started this system where a person if wants to go and move around indian ocean or pass through the indian ocean they will need to pay taxes to portuguese so cata system or permit system was executed by alfonso de albuquerque so you can say that the idea was given by francisco de almeida but execution came during the time of alfonso de albuquerque after him nino de cunha came he is not very important he only shifted the headquarter from cochin to goa in 1530 and he also started salt monopoly that's why he is very very important so nino de cunha the rule is from 1529 to 38 okay that's it that is something which is important as a timeline which you need to remember okay other things are also there one by one we will come to the details but this timeline is important okay neha roy you have asked that what is the treaty of tordesillas the neha the treaty of tordesillas was to divide the non christian world into two parts it divided with an imaginary line in the atlantic ocean here just come to this map can you see atlantic ocean here right neha just understand from the west of cape of verde island they had a imaginary line and spain and portugal they both had this treaty of tordesillas where they decided that they are having this imaginary line and as per this line the western part will go to spain in spain can explore in the western side and can you know explore cities establish towns trading posts do whatever they want all the resources of non christian world in the western part can be controlled or explored by the for uh, by the spain but portugal can go in the east so that's why portuguese came to india because they got the eastern part okay so they just divided the world into two sides west and east west is with spain east is with portugal for exploration for trading for making colonies to establish different posts that's why okay so that they would they won't be fighting among themselves because portugal and spain they were two big business lords of the world okay they wanted to be super power both of them started fighting a lot of clash was going on so they decided that if we will continue fighting like this it is a loss of time energy and money so it's better to divide the world and focus in our own areas and we will not interfere in each other's areas however uh, you will see in world history that later they both got united and they you know they came under the same nation a union happened but that is a part of world history which is not important right now here just understand by the treaty of tordesillas the non christian world was divided into east and west the eastern side is with portuguese now so portuguese could explore the eastern side so they came to india fine is it clear okay those of you who have just joined the class you guys need to like and share the video because i want that live audience should increase every day it should not be decreasing because the team would be motivated and we all would like to bring a lot of courses for you if you support this idea of live classes and free lecture series because my team is planning that all the other educators will bring new courses for you like i am doing the history part with you so similarly you'll get a polity class then you'll get a economy class you may get a complete series of ncert also so if you support and like comment interact with us then only we would be able to have that mindset to create something new for you right so remember that the treaty of tordesillas happened in 1494 but in 1497 the rulers decided to initiate the exploration okay treaty happened in 1494 but in 1497 the rulers of portugal and spain they decided to work in this division of non christian world between them 
by an imaginary line okay it was in the atlantic ocean it was somewhere 1300 miles west of cape of verde island and then they just decided to go accordingly clear fine so now guys as you are very much clear about the portuguese and their intentions you have understood about vasco da gama also okay so vasco da gama he was the one who just explored the new sea route and initiated three factories and uh, you know in uh, kochi in karnanur calicut after him when vasco da gama you know when he just understood that factories are going fine and we can have our governors then he went back to europe okay he will come again but he will just come to check that why so much of corruption is happening in india later he will come to know that the portuguese governors are being very corrupt and that's why he decided to come back so vasco da gama came back in 1524 when he died in india only but in 1524 when he come when he came here it was just to check the corruption and the issues related to the portuguese governance in india but during this visit only he died in india in 1524 okay so this is something which is like a story that uh, you know the place of birth and death is sometimes decided by the god or universe so he just came to india back after so many years just to die and after this in 1524 uh, he was dead and then of course his journey ends now you need to discuss something which is very much important and related to the first governor francisco de almeida you should not have this confusion that vasco da gama is not the governor okay vasco da gama was the explorer he was the first traveler to reach india and start factories start trading posts when he decided to fortify the settlements he had a clash with zamorin okay and he you know had to fight the battles also but to have a better executions portuguese government decided to send governors in india so the first governor is francisco de almeida okay he is the newly appointed governor and he was asked to consolidate the position of the portuguese power in india and also he was asked to destroy the muslim trade by seizing aden ormuz and malacca so when he will try to seize aden ormuz and malacca he will have to fight the battles against the egyptian sultan and the combined army of zamorin so why it will be there because see at that time indian polity was not stable india was divided under different kingdoms and rulers but only in gujarat we had a political stability so with this political stability what will happen let's understand i hope you can see egypt here okay the egyptian sultan is very much interested in india gujarat is having a political stability so gujarati ruler and the ruler of calicut zamorin they will have a combined navy and this naval battle is going to be there which is known as the battle of diu in which initially in the first battle francisco de almeida lost and his son was also killed and next year only he will take revenge and will defeat everyone so this naval battle is very very important and i want you to understand that aden ormuz and malacca these are also very very important posts i hope you remember i just uh highlighted it for you here aden ormuz and malacca so the first portuguese governor will seize these three important posts look at the location it's like blocking the entire indian ocean isn't it it's like blocking the entire indian ocean completely okay so when the fight will start the fight will start in 1507 in 1507 portuguese uh, with the governor 
uh, Francisco de Almeida, they were defeated in the naval battle. So, in 1507, the first governor, Francisco de Almeida, was defeated. But he took the revenge. He took the revenge with the combined Egyptian, Gujarati, and Zemurin's navy again in the next year. Because in the first battle in 1507, here Almeida's son was killed. Next year in 1508, Almeida avenged his defeat by totally crushing the two navies and then he started blue water policy. So, two battles were there. In 1508, he got the victory by crushing the entire navy and defeating everyone totally. Okay. Please understand that in 1507, he got defeated. But in 1508, he got the revenge. Okay, and started blue water policy. What is the meaning of blue water policy? Can you understand this term? Blue water policy means focus on water, not on land. This idea was given by Francisco de Almeida that if you want to win India and if you want to secure everything here, you would be able to rule the resources and this country only if you rule Indian Ocean. So focus on Indian Ocean, not on the lands of India. Because that would be in, their con in your control only if you just get the Indian Ocean. And that's why he seized these three important coastal lands. Aden, Hormuz, Malacca. So in case if anyone wants to come through the Red Sea, they can only come through Aden. So Aden is now control is in the control of Portuguese. Hormuz, the area coming from the Baghdad. Here you can see Persia and Baghdad, they can come through this Hormuz coast, so they won't be able to come here. And if somebody wants to come from this side, again Malacca is in the control of Portuguese. Right? So it's just a complete game. Right? Now, as the idea was already given by Alfonso de, uh, uh, Francisco de Almeida, so the second governor, Alfonso de Albuquerque, what he will do? He will just execute that you know, the policy of blue water policy and that idea which was given by Almeida should be executed nicely. And that's why he initiated the permit system. Okay. He initiated the permit system that if you want to cross Aden, Ormuz and Malacca or if you want to cross the Indian Ocean, then you need to take permission. He introduced permit system for other ships. And he started exercising the control over major shipbuilding centers in India. And that's why Alfonso de Albuquerque is regarded as the real founder of Portuguese power in India. So, during his rule only, he used to ask his people, uh, his uh, Portuguese uh, men, to get married and settle down in India. He wanted his soldiers and uh, other, you know, people to get married with the Indian girls and settle down in India so that they can establish more control on the Indian lands. They started village administration. They introduced new crops also. So during the rule of uh, during the rule of uh, Alfonso de Albuquerque, you will see that he is really behaving like a ruler, not like a trader. He, you know, used to control every everything in the, in the village administration. They started making new roads, initiating new canal system in India. And uh, they wanted to control things by controlling and uh, executing the polity with a very powerful responsibility. So that responsibility was there with Albuquerque, uh, Albuquerque and during his time, you will see. And why they are getting so much of power, why they are not, uh, you know, getting defeated by Arabs and Egyptian sultans? Because of the timber. Because there was no availability of timber in the Gulf and Red Sea area. And that's why. The Muslim intermediaries had no ship building at all. Their ships were not that strong. They were not much organized. They were not very organized also. They were not disciplined also. That's why. Okay. So this is something which is new, very, very important. Now, remember names of the new crops which got introduced during the time of Portuguese, especially Alfonso de Albuquerque. Tobacco, cashew nut, and Better plantation varieties of coconut. Okay. So, these three are very, very important. 
there are other things also like potato and you know so many other things like red chili and all but tobacco cashew nut and bitter varieties of coconut are very very important okay so this is about albuquerque now let's come to nino di cunha nino di cunha he assumed his office of portuguese governorship in november 1529 okay after one year only he shifted the headquarter portuguese headquarter in india from kochi into goa because goa was better location and there they wanted to have some uh, relations with gujarat also so if you read about the mughal history uh, there is a ruler bahadur shah okay not bahadur shah zafar bahadur shah of gujarat so when bahadur shah of gujarat was in conflict with the mughal emperor at that time bahadur shah was getting a lot of backing from portuguese if you remember during the mughal struggle what happens see entire india was struggling okay we had no political stability but in gujarat the political stability was there okay and portuguese already had a control a very good control in the coastal areas in this entire part of west coast now portuguese knew that gujaratis are very important for us but you will see that later on this ruler will try to make a wall in between because they thought that uh, you know gujarati trade is getting disturbed due to portuguese interference on daily basis and that's why bahadur shah later decided that he will make a wall and he will build a new uh, build a new wall uh, to just have a separation between portuguese and gujaratis but uh, later on the new story will be there when he will try to raise a wall and he would be called for lunch and then he would be killed in the portuguese ship only but they, that will come later but before all these clashes when portuguese had a very good friendship with gujaratis these gujaratis started attacking on delhi also they started going against mughals they started killing the mughal dominance in india because they had a very good backing so when the mughal emperor humayun humayun if you remember the story of humayun he basically in 1526 babar came to india but babar was able to re rule for a very short period only for four years after babar humayun came and if you know the history of humayun he was always disturbed because of his brothers and also because of the sher shah suri right so for 15 years he was in exile and then he came back to india by getting some uh, you know uh, help from the iran and then he reestablished the mughal throne after uh, the uh, second battle of panipat but that is something uh, which we will be discussing later uh, not by the second battle the second battle of panipat would be there during the time of akbar but you will see that uh, humayun when he will reestablish the throne and when akbar will be there after the reestablishment only humayun got died after 6 months only because uh, he just fell down from the stairs of library and then he died so at a very small age akbar will take the control so during the akbar's time we will see the second battle of panipat in the first battle babar got the victory so if you remember humayun was always disturbed okay because he divided the entire uh, entire you know region whatever the victorious part or the position was there with their control he divided it among his brothers and the brothers were not supportive enough now you will see that when humayun was busy in fighting with afghanis in the east okay against sher shah suri he was fighting when he was fighting against sher shah suri in the east when mughals were fighting against afghanis in the east in the eastern part of india at that time the gujarati ruler bahadur shah came to delhi and he wanted to acquire the throne of delhi due to which humayun had to have a peaceful treaty with sher shah suri in between by stopping the war there in the eastern part of india and he came back to delhi and then he waged a war against this gujarati ruler bahadur shah defeated bahadur shah but he was not able to capture gujarat for long because bahadur shah always have a backing 
from the Portuguese. So here Portuguese from this thing, they understood that the internal Indian polity is also very important to control for them. Because if they want profit, for profit they should control the internal politics also. Right? This kind of mindset was there. So this is the story of Bahadur Shah of Gujarat. So Bahadur Shah of Gujarat, during his conflict with the Mughal Emperor Humayun, he used to take a lot of help from the Portuguese. So by, you know, with this help in, uh, you know, in exchange, he gave them, uh, he gave them in 1534 the islands of Basin. And uh, the Basin island is very, very important, which is here. Okay, it is here, Basin. Okay, so the island of Basin was given to the Portuguese. And he also promised them that he would be giving a base in Diu to Portuguese. But later on, when Bahadur Shah saw that Portuguese are interfering a lot, and when Portuguese, uh, you know, relation became sore, then he, you know, understood that now I should take control. By that time, Humayun also withdrew from Gujarat in 1536. So he became very independent. And then he saw that, you know, Portuguese people are fighting with the inhabitants and they have a clash with the local public. So he wanted to raise a wall of partition between the Gujarati area and the Portuguese dominion. So the area should be in a separation. So when he started doing it, uh, you know, uh, Portuguese never wanted it to be like that. So, you know, Portuguese started opposing it that no, you should not do it. They started negotiations. But in this negotiation, you will see that the uh, Portuguese understood that this Gujarati ruler is not understanding, is not doing any negotiations. So they just decided to invite him for lunch. So he was invited to a Portuguese ship and Bahadur Shah was killed in that Portuguese uh, ship only in 1537. Okay, so this is again a very important time when in 1537 you see that a ruler is getting killed by the Portuguese in their ship. Okay, also you will see that Nino de Kunha attempted to increase the Portuguese influence in Bengal. And he wanted to have a lot of Portuguese nationals settle down in the area of Hooghly as their headquarter. And they wanted to start the salt monopoly there. But what happened was that in the later stages, these uh, you know, Portuguese traders, they became very indisciplined. And they started very ruthless conversions also. Religiously, they became intolerant. And they captured important slaves also girls uh, of uh, you know uh, Shah Jahan's Begum were captured and due to that Shah Jahan became very very angry and he just thought to remove Portuguese from the Hooghly coast but before understanding the fall of Portuguese you need to understand the favorable conditions for Portuguese in India okay so first favorable condition is that instability was there in India only in the Gujarati area, political power was there. And it was during the rule of Mahmud Begara, who ruled from 15, uh, 1458 to 1511. So during his rule only, the Portuguese got a lot of, uh, you know, clash uh, to initiate their policies and factories and fortifications. After Mahmud Begara, the Gujarati ruler was in control of Portuguese power. And then you will see during the time of Bahadur Shah, things are better. Okay. So remember, before Bahadur Shah, before Bahadur Shah, who was killed in 1537, we had Mahmud Beghara. Okay. We had Mahmud Beghara. And only his dominion in Gujarat was a very sta stable dominion. So he was from 1458. To 1511 and this part is a very powerful part in the Gujarati politics okay and the entire North India is uh, under different dominions in South India also you know that by this time the Vijayanagar Empire lost its importance Bahamani Kingdom was also not doing good the Deccan area in the South India uh, Bahamani Kingdom got broken up into so many smaller kingdoms. They were known as Deccan Sultanate, the Grand Alliance, when they got joined together, right? Ahmadnagar, Bijapur, Golconda, Bidar, Berar, they all got divided in South India. So none of the power was there 
who can challenge Portuguese power. Okay, and they had no navy worthy of its name, nor did they think of developing a naval strength. Okay, they never thought about it. And if you look at the Chinese emperor, they had their own limited intention in you know uh, their own uh, their Chinese area and on their own Chinese ships. So they had no intention to come here in India and do something in Indian Ocean. And if you compare it with the Arab merchants and Arab ship owners who had a dominance initially, they had nothing to match the organization of Portuguese power. The unity was not there with the Arab merchants anymore. And when they lost that unity, they lost everything. And first of all, you need to understand that Portuguese ships had cannons placed on them. Okay, so cannons are important for warfare also. So it's a good thing that they had cannons, soap, okay, on their ships. So they could always initiate the war anytime, whenever they wanted. So all these things brought a very favorable condition for Portuguese power in India. Okay. I hope you understood. If you look at the Portuguese administration, it had a very good administration. If you look at this governorship and all, the head of administration was the Viceroy, who served there for three years with his secretary, and later years they made a council also. They also started their own European style of uh, uh, church building in India, and uh, that punch ten style of temple architecture where you see today. Uh, it is based on a stellar structure, a star formation. So it was also somehow taken from the uh, church architecture which was introduced by the Portuguese in India. They started making portico houses also. Like if you look at the government quarters today, they are very small and uh, consolidated areas in which a lot of people can live and uh, have a good space to, you know, have a kitchen also, washroom also, a bedroom area also, a small hall should also be there. So all those uh, daily necessities would be fulfilled in a quarter. So this idea of making quarters was also given by the Portuguese because they used to make these houses for their people to, you know, have a good trade establishment in India and to live a good happy life, have a right place and a space where they could, you know, hold things. Also, we had a lot of uh, religious policies of Portuguese. Initially, they were very tolerant, but later on, they will become very intolerant. Like if you remember, Jesuit fathers, Rodolfo Equavivo and Antonio Montserrat, they were selected to go to the Akbar's court. They went to Fatehpur Sikri and they received a lot of honor also. Initially, they had a mindset that they will convert Akbar and Akbar will change the religion. But it was not possible, of course. Akbar never did it. Akbar knew that he will be following things according to his own way. But he just wanted to know about Christianity. And that's why uh, he asked Jesuit fathers to come to the Fatehpur Sikri. And he welcomed uh, them. But Akbar never got converted. But see, Akbar never got converted. But Portuguese wanted to convert Akbar. This is something which you should always remember. Okay. so. Everything is now clear about the entire, you know, power of Portuguese. Later on, uh, you need to understand that when they decided to capture the, uh, you know, areas in Hooghly and when they understood that uh, uh, somehow uh, the clash is going with the Mughals now, so then a uh, downfall got started. Basically, in 1613, you will see that Portuguese offended Jahangir by capturing Mughal ships and imprisoning many Muslims and plundering many cargoes. You know, it offended Jahangir. And that's why they started offending, uh, you know, Indians in a very big way. And they also became very intolerant also. So this is a very big reason that a religious intolerance came in their mind. And that's why a problem got started. Okay. You need to understand that a uh, cruel slave trade was also there. Uh, which was started by Portuguese by the time of 17th century. So uh, Portuguese, uh, ye, of course, they were already doing trade and commerce, but a cruel slave trade was introduced by them. 
so they started seizing hindu and muslim children and uh, they used to brought up uh, them as a christians and shah jahan when he saw it he ordered bengal governor kasim khan to take the action against the portuguese and that's why the seize of hugli happened ultimately portuguese they become they became uh, you know uh, robbers and they started the activities related to piracy and uh, finally the entire power got declined and of course you know that these kind of private trades and uh, privacy uh, you know piracy and uh, things like illegal activities don't function and they are not very long lasting so of course by the time of 18th century they lost their all the commercial influence and uh, few of them uh, started having their own private trade but at their own individual capacity they were they were doing it they become robbers they started doing piracy uh, in the bay of bengal and then of course they were not able to control the emergence of powerful dynasty in egypt in persia in north india and of course a maratha power was also rising in india so we know that how maratha captured celsit and Bis 1739 from portuguese the scene was given by portuguese to that gujarati ruler bahadur shah if you remember bahadur shah gave the scene right this area he uh, bahadur shah only gave it but marathas recaptured it they got the scene back to them they got celsit also so bombay celsit the scene all those entire areas were now there uh, and they came highlighted in this picture and then portuguese decided to divert their colonization towards brazil because the discovery of brazil happened so we know that later on spain and portugal they got uh, aligned together there was a unity and uh, there was no more clash in between so of course they decided to go together move to together and they thought to uh, focus more on brazil than in india okay so this is the entire rise and fall of portuguese power in india and uh, this is how they got the uh, dominance okay if you have any doubts please let me know we will cover it we will discuss it and after portuguese i think we can discuss something about dutch okay if you want to discuss something that you can let me know Okay, I can see few comments are there. Yes, see, basically by 1663, the Dutch will will uh, will win all the Portuguese forts on the Malabar coast, and uh, they will just uh, you know defeat Portuguese from India. And by the time of 1663, Portuguese will have all the powers. Okay. Yes. they made shirts also yes okay fine they never had a direct clash with britishers okay they never had direct clash with britishers yes i'll discuss the decline again with you don't worry uh, there is a question by warrior that is there any difference between blue water policy and permit system yes the difference is that the blue water policy is the policy of dominance which was started by francisco de almeida it was a idea it was an idea why because blue water policy mean controlling the indian ocean okay but to introduce this idea the next ruler francisco uh, after francisco de almeida the next ruler alfonso de albuquerque decided to execute it by a law which was permit system okay so blue water policy is an idea it's a policy but to implement that policy the carter system or the permit system is a proper law by which they will collect the taxes or the money for from other ships coming from any other country passing the indian ocean okay so carter system is a taxation and blue water policy is a system or a idea by which they can have a control on the indian ocean clear okay i'll ensure that the playlist is updated don't worry okay i'll bring some pyqs also i have some questions today also we'll discuss it with you
okay fine i'll just discuss the ending again the decline again because there are few students uh, who want me to discuss the decline again with you so yes let me discuss the portuguese decline again basically what happened was to understand the decline you need to understand the policy of nino di cunha okay nino di cunha who ruled from 1529 to 1538 he was not doing anything to increase the portuguese dominance but he was just trying to expand more he wanted to go towards the bengali area okay so first of all he shifted the headquarter from cochin to goa in 1530 so you can see from cochin to goa they came and during his rule only he had a clash with the gujarati ruler okay gujarati ruler bahadur shah who was killed in 1537 why because bahadur shah wanted to raise a wall in between the gujarati and portuguese areas so that there is no interference and disturbance now you see that portuguese when they decided to expand more and when they got the uh, you know when they got and reached till the area of hugli there they started salt manufacturing and they wanted to monopolize it salt monopoly so that they, no, no other company can manufacture their salt so in hugli when they started the salt manufacturing and all there during the time of nino di cunha you will see that a clash got started between mughals and portuguese if you remember already they were backing gujarati ruler against mughals and when they came to this area of bengal they humiliated muslims hindus by starting cruel slave trade by capturing hindus and muslims and converting them they captured few slaves of jahangir also right that's why jahangir was offended after which then you will see shah jahan will also be offended because two girls of mumtaz mahal were captured so mumtaz were mumtaz was extremely angry and upset he complained it to shah jahan that what is happening just take care of the bengal area our girls are getting captured and kidnapped so that's why shah jahan ordered that this entire trade should be ended and the hugli area should be regained again and portuguese should go out of this area so that's why they just went out and the discipline was not there anymore the skills were not there anymore after few years we will see that portuguese won't be able to get consolidation when the rise of marathas will happen in south and when some other dynasties in egypt and in north india will come into the power right because of that powerful struggle portuguese were not able to survive and they will lose their power fine i hope the decline is clear now okay i'll try to cover few important points here for you which are important for prelims and mains both but before i come to the questions and pyq discussion i just want you to see this map see we need to discuss all these european settlements here we just covered the portuguese right so can you see the portuguese map here right if you can just understand this map try to understand this map and locate it in the indian map can you see they had dominance in sri lanka also they were there in colombia they were there in gale matara okay trikonomola and they are here in cochin they are here in calicut kannanur goa bombay okay see uh, bombay was under the control of portuguese but they will give it in a Uh, as a dowry to britishers later i'll tell you the story of bombay but now just see and look at the trading posts the scene was given by the bahadur shah the gujarati ruler but it was again recaptured by the marathas back okay now here you can see diu in 1535 they captured diu also they had the domination in surat also in daman also okay here you can see in hugli area 
they had some dominance in this area of Masuli Patnam Portuguese were there, Nag Patnam Portuguese are there. So look at this power and all the red circles which I have made it. This is just for your understanding to know for, like the areas wherever Portuguese dominion was there. Okay, this is clear. If this is clear, then we will come to the British settlement and French settlement and Dutch settlement. Okay, Dutch, Danes. But before coming to other European powers, we need to discuss Portuguese and clarify it. You got the rise and fall clear in your mind? You can see the factories and locate and understand the locations, right? So, if I say that give me few points due to which the fall started, the Portuguese fall started, then what points can you give me? First point is other European powers coming in India, especially Dutch. Dutch were very powerful. They defeated Portug Portuguese everywhere. Second reason, powerful Indian dynasties like Marathas, powerful neighboring dynasties in Egypt and other, you know, Arabian rulers. Loss of discipline and organization, starting cruel slave trade and intolerant attitude against Hindus and Muslims to make conversions and influence Christianity on them. All these points led to the fall of Portuguese power in India. Clear? Fine. I hope this is very clear. Now, we need to discuss few other, you know, areas. Uh, we need to discuss Dutch and Danes also. Okay. Yes, welcome, welcome. Fine. So, as we have already covered discussion on Portuguese, now we can come to Dutch and Anglo-Dutch rivalry. Okay. So, see basically uh, after Portuguese, Dutch will start their uh, new journey and they will establish their first factory in Masuli Patnam in 1605. Masuli Patnam is in Andhra Pradesh. If you can look at this map, this is very, very important. And we are talking about Dutch settlements now. I'll mark it with the black color for you. Okay. We are discussing Dutch settlements. And I'll mark it with black, uh, black color for you. This is Dutch. They are in Pulikat. They are in Masuli Patnam. They are here in Sri Lanka also. And they were more interested in spices. You just remember this point about Dutch. Okay. Dutch are interested in spices, and that's why they went to Indonesia. They will go to Indonesia later. They will have a settlement with Britishers because they knew that they want to focus on the spice island Indonesia, and that's why they decided to not interfere with Britishers in India. So, Britishers said that we will not go to Indonesia. You can go there and Dutch said, okay, we will stay in Indonesia and we won't come back to India. Later on, the British and Dutch settlement will happen. Whenever we will talk about Britishers or English, then we will use the word Anglo. Okay, so Anglo-Dutch rivalry, Anglo-French rivalry, Anglo-Maratha struggle, Anglo-Sikh war. Everywhere, whenever I use the word Anglo, Anglo means English. English means Britishers. Okay? Understand. English means Britishers. Anglo. So, you need to understand the rise of Dutch and then Anglo-Dutch rivalry. Why? Because the time period is very similar. The Dutch power, which was already there going very good in India, they got a lot of disturbances when British power came. And that's why they started fighting. Fine? Now, as we are discussing about Dutch, we will come to this map. We will discuss Dutch. That's very, very important. But you may have a doubt in your mind that what is the difference between Dutch and Danes. Okay. So just understand Dutch and Danes. They, they both are neighbors, but they are different. Many of the students, they get confused. 
between Dutch and Danes. So Danes are different. Danes means Danish. Danish settlements are different. I'll discuss Danish settlements in the end. Uh, Danes were more, um, you know, concerned about missionary activities in India. They wanted to spread Christianity. They were not interested in trade. So that's why we will not discuss Danes right now. We will only discuss Dutch right now. Clear? Let me have some water, then I'll continue. As now we are discussing Dutch and Danes, you need to understand the difference between Dutch and Danes first. Dutch means uh, people coming from Netherlands, today's Netherlands area. So they had their own language Dutch, Dutch speaking people. And uh, people coming from Denmark were known as Danes and they had uh, their own language and it was known as Danish. They were Danish people. So when I say Danes, you need to understand we are talking about Denmark. When I say Dutch, that is Netherlands. Right now, we will discuss Dutch. This is the topic of uh, the, you know, uh, the topic which is coming now next. So, after discussing Dutch, we will come to Danes and Denmark. But understand that Dutch is Netherlands. Fine. And the first man is Cornelis de Hotman. He was the first Dutchman to reach Sumatra, Benetum. And he was there in 1596. And the first Dutch settlement was in Masuli Patnam. Okay. After Masuli Patnam, they established many centers in India. Okay. And you will see that how they will also come in the clash with the internal politics. And they will come with the clash of Nawab in Bengal also. So that is also something which you need to remember. Before coming to that point, this is a location which you need to remember. Dutch, the first factory of Dutch, which is in Masuli Patnam. Okay, so they were there by the time of 1605. Okay, 1605 when Dutch came and established the factory. Now, when they established their factory, their trading centers, uh, they became a threat to the Portuguese. We have just covered covered about Portuguese, right? So uh, they had to defeat Portuguese first if they wanted to have power in India. So first of all, they captured Nagpatnam near Madras. Nagpatnam is here. This is Nagpatnam. They first captured Nagpatnam from Portuguese and then made a very strong hold all over the South India to defeat Portuguese everywhere. Okay everywhere but when they started raising their power by that time english became their enemy because we know that already portuguese uh, were not able to handle handle their success and maintain their success they already got uh, you know defeated and uh, they were losing their powers everywhere so they just went away but after portuguese the next challenge was the anglo challenge the english challenge because Britishers came and Dutch now started fighting with English and that climax of fight reached at Amboyana. Amboyana is a place which is in the present day Indonesia where Dutch had captured the part of Indonesia, this Amboyana from Portuguese in 1605 and there they massacred 10 Englishmen and 9 Japanese. So this battle of Amboyana 
1623 is a very very important battle you will see that the british settlements are also rising everywhere in india ultimately when britishers and dutch they understood that it's impossible to uh, you know have a settlement or a kind of fight continued so they decided to stop fighting and have a settlement that dutch will remain in indonesia and english will remain in india so that's why there would be no clash and no disturbance they divided these two colonies and started focusing in their own areas okay so that's why dutch went away from india they took care of indonesia and britishers took care of india because a long battle was going on between dutch and english but before going to anglo dutch rivalry let's come to a question as you wanted me to discuss some pyqs so there is a question from 2015 the staple commodities of export by english east india company from bengal in the middle of the 18th century were staple commodities okay means commodities in a very general way so the right answer is cotton silk saltpetre opium saltpetre is barood okay to make explosive things so of course we know that cotton silk saltpetre and opium opium was in trade with china so that's why to trade and to have a balance of trade with china opium was grown in india so these things were the staple commodities of export by english east india company from bengal as we are now discussing about the anglo dutch rivalry and english and dutch clashing with each other that's why this question was there now understand the arrival of dutch the fall of dutch fall of dutch is happening in india because of english okay first man was cornelis de hotman he was the first dutchman initially he reached sumatra and benetum as they were more interested in spices they were they became very much interested in indonesia so in 1596 they reached very near to india and they established their first factory in masuli patnam in 1605 which you need to remember and remember that, that they captured nagpatnam also near madras okay from portuguese because portuguese initially had the power in the nagpatnam area now after capturing nagpatnam they started their dominance in the south india when they started dominating south india they had clash with britishers so that's why anglo dutch rivalry happened anglo means british or english okay understand that in asia asia is a continent where india is a country india pakistan china all these countries are in asia right these all are neighboring countries we have clash among you know ourselves like indians pakistanis chinese these you know countries you will see that they are having some boundary dispute sometimes they fight sometimes they trade sometimes they stay happy sometimes there is a peace sometimes there is no peace similarly in europe europe is there europe is a continent and in europe we have different countries like spain portugal france germany england so all these countries want to be superpower they wanted to be dominance okay dominant in the world so to get that dominance they are fighting among themselves so first of all we need to understand the fight which is among the european powers themselves out of which britishers will get the victory so how britishers are defeating everyone that we need to understand and then we will come to the conclusion that how the india was there when britishers wanted to have a conquest in india right so before coming to the british conquest understand the european rivalry here as i have discussed with you britishers were fighting against dutch so anglo dutch rivalry was at its peak in the battle of amboyana okay amboyana <coughs> here you need to remember a date that in 1605 they captured this place of amboyana from portuguese 
like the the way they captured nagpatnam in south india similarly now in 1605 dutch are having amboyana in 1623 the battle is going to be there which is the battle of amboyana in which they massacred 10 englishmen and 9 japanese here you will see that after this fight it would be decided that it's just a waste of waste of time energy and money if you remember treaty of tordesillas in which spain and portugal they decided to have a kind of compromise that they will divide the non christian world in two parts similarly a settlement would be there they will compromise that britishers will go out of indonesia and they will not claim anything there so that in in indonesia only dutch can focus and also they decided that uh, dutch will not interfere in india anymore now dutch started their monopoly in trade with black pepper and other spices and the most traded commodities in india by dutch were silk cotton indigo rice opium this is very very important you need to understand in case in prelims they ask you that what were the most important indian commodities that the dutch traded so there you need to remember silk cotton indigo rice opium i just want you to compare this statement this line with the question which was asked in prelims in 2015 there they asked about the english right and here you can again see that cotton silk opium these things are very very common but dutch were not uh, having just cotton silk and opium with dutch we are having indigo also which makes them different rice also and they are not interested in saltpetre because saltpetre is something which is for explosive things it's a barood okay to make barood to make explosives okay so understand that dutch are with indigo and rice okay it's a very important thing which makes them different but it doesn't mean that english will not trade in indigo english will trade in indigo but in later centuries because the question is about which time it is about the time of 18th century right when the stable commodities were there indigo will be always there because we know that indigo revolts were there in india but saltpetre is not with dutch other things are common fine now the question is when there was already a settlement a compromise was there the compromise was there that in 1667 they decided that english will go out of indonesia and dutch will go out of india right so when already in 1667 the compromise was there then why the battle of hugli happened in 1759 again between english and dutch see according to the compromise dutch decided in 1667 that they will be only in indonesia they will not come to india they will not interfere in india right but if you remember the story of bengal where mir jafar mir jafar if you remember the story during the battle of plassey what happened mir jafar he killed siraj ud daula and then became the nawab of bengal but mir jafar became a puppet nawab so he started revolting so he was replaced by his son in law mir qasim so when mir jafar was replaced by mir qasim in bengal he thought to defeat britishers and to defeat britishers he had to take help from dutch who were there in indonesia now the question is why mir jafar took help from dutch because he knew that europeans are having better army and navy and he also knew that it's it would not be easy for him to fight against britishers without any uh, you know armed help and he also had a good idea about the uh, history of anglo dutch rivalries the 
you know battles of amboyana and the compromise of 1667 he already knew about it so dutch got involved with mir jafar and uh, they dutch also thought that you know it is a good chance to come back in india and to capture some more lands in india so they became very greedy so this greed of dutch uh, you know it pulled them towards hugli with the help of mir jafar and that's why the battle of hugli happened the english retaliated and they defeated dutch it was the last time and this time dutch really apologized that okay we are really sorry we forgot that we just need to remain in indonesia it was the last time we don't want to fight more we will go back they just went away from their uh, this area and it was a huge blow to dutch ambitions in india and then they never came back to india okay so in case in prelims if they ask you that after the compromise of 1667 do you see uh, dutch coming back to india again so yes once they came only to help mir jafar okay i hope you know the story of mir jafar do you want me to discuss that because see i am following a sequence of chronology so the battle of classy and buxar would be discussed in the next class but if you want for you know a short brief idea i can tell you but i think that it's a very easy point and we don't need to discuss it in detail you all know about mir jafar right okay fine so we all know about mir jafar that in the battle of plassey he killed sirajuddaula with the help of robert clive he became the nawab of bengal but he was a puppet nawab so he revolted against this uh, unlawful attitude of britishers when he was replaced by his son in law mir qasim he revolted and took help from dutch so dutch came to help mir jafar but here in this battle of hugli dutch got defeated and it was the last time when they came to india it was a huge blow to their ambitions in india now we can discuss about english okay fine dutch is clear any doubts guys So the journey of English will start from 1599, when a group of English merchants, who used to call them merchant adventurers, they formed a company. And on 31st December 1600, Queen Elizabeth I issued a charter. Okay, the charter where she gave rights of exclusive trading to this company. It means that no other company. from uh, you know that part from that country can come to india no other english company will uh, reach to the indian areas or would come to trade in east so the company name was governor and company of merchant of london trading into the east indies and in short they became east india company so initially the mon monopoly was only for 15 years but later in may 1609 it was extended indefinitely by a fresh charter so what do you mean by a charter charter is a is is an official document it's like a promise the government is giving you a promise that only you will be having this right and a trade to have a you know direction in this so that's why it's a very important thing but before uh, they came to india and before they Could uh, initiate things here. We need to understand how Captain Thomas Best came here, and when they were there, uh, th when they wanted to be here, you will see that they had to see a clash with Portuguese. See, Portuguese and English they became friends later because Portuguese gave uh, Bombay as a dowry to English, right? With the matrimon matrimonial alliances, he. problem would be resolved and relations will improve but when they wanted to come here initially they had to fight battles in surat and uh, it was the rule of uh, uh, jahangir when you will see that portuguese are fighting against english and 
a lot of diplomacy techniques were used by portuguese that's very very important to understand after this understanding only you will be able to get the point of english east india company okay the entire you know progress of english east india company would be discussed but before progress of english east india company let's discuss the initial stages okay so it was the time of 1612 when captain thomas best defeated portuguese okay in the sea of surat and in this particular defeat you will see that they will not gain a lot of factories or privileges in india because it's just a starting point but it impressed jahangir why jahangir is impressed see mughals had no navy of its name mughals you know they had nothing and the power was of no match in front of portuguese also portuguese already defeated uh, you know so many ships and they were able to uh, defeat the muslim intermediaries also arab muslim rulers also so somehow there was an image that portuguese are so powerful nobody can defeat them they are having cannons on their ships they are so powerful so this defeat of portuguese impressed jahangir that english are so powerful that image was tarnished now right that portuguese power image that powerful image was tarnished now and that's why with uh, you know this new impressed feeling jahangir gave permission to english uh, to establish a factory at surat under thomas eldworth okay so in 1613 they got the permission okay but in 1615 they started the uh, factory so in 1615 you will see sir thomas rio came okay and uh, he was the ambassador of james one so when he came to jahangir he stayed there till february 1619 he wanted to influence jahangir and wanted to have some more trading privileges but he was unsuccessful okay he was not getting a lot of privileges he there he was there but he just got some rights to establish some factories there at agra ahmedabad baroch here you need to remember this word baroch because there was a question in prelims in which they asked that um, uh, in which all locations the factories were established by english so in the option baroch is there if you will see pyqs then you will see this uh, A location is mentioned in one of the questions. So remember that till February sixteen nineteen, they only had factories in Agra, Ahmedabad, and Baroch. Okay. Now Britishers wanted to have more factories, but uh, they were going very slowly and they were moving step by step. You'll see that the way Dutch initiated their dominance in India and the way Portuguese were doing it. they were very powerful and within few years they captured a very big coastal land and a great coastline under their control but here if you talk about english they are very slow and steady in this race and they are going with a very step by step strategy so here you will see that bombay had been gifted to king charles ii by the king of portugal by because uh, king of portugal married catherine you know uh, a portuguese princess that's why as a dowry bombay had been gifted to king charles ii okay it's a very important point and uh, it was on uh, an annual payment of 10 pounds only it was in the time of 1668 so that's why bombay became the headquarter of uh, you know western presidency uh, for english and that's why uh, from surat to bombay they shifted their headquarter in 1687 So just remember this is the story of bombay which is very very important that in 1668 king charles ii got bombay as a dowry okay because he married the Port uh, the portuguese princess catherine that's why now let's understand the progress of english company 
okay how they will get the progress from uh, south to north they will come so one by one the position will be improved so first uh, improvement came with the golden farman this golden farman was issued by the sultan of golconda in 1632 okay it was for 500 pagodas only okay for 500 pagodas pagoda is the currency which was there in the golconda so when english got this uh, you know golden farman it was a very important farman and the sultan of golconda gave, gave them this farman in 1632 and on a payment of 500 pagodas only uh, per year annually they earned the privilege of trading freely on the ports of golconda so a uh, duty free trade duty free trading right was given to them okay here you will see that in 1639 something very important happened and this is also a question which was asked in prelims okay uh, in prelims they asked about this statement directly this is a very important statement there was a member of masuhuli patnam council and uh, you know the british merchant francis day used to be there so francis day was a merchant and he got a very important permission this british merchant francis day in 1639 received a permission from the ruler of chandigarh to build a 45 factory at madras okay at madras which later became fort saint george and replaced masuli patnam as the headquarter of the english settlement in south india after this you will see that madras will become a very important position for them for madras they will fight battles there would be carnatic wars to get madras to win madras okay thereafter britishers extended their trading activities in the eastern side also they started factories in uh hariharpur in mahanadi delta of balasore in odisha in 1633 which is again very very important okay so just remember these three lines because uh, these three statements directly came in prelims and that's why all these statements are important for you you need to write it in the mains answer also whenever you get we will uh, complete it before prelims okay don't worry we will complete the series before prelims only i'll ensure that uh, the mains content is also covered with you but before prelims we will complete it i have a target of do it within 2 3 weeks fine so this was about english and here i just want you to know that as they are now getting the part of first they got bombay right first they got bombay in 1668 then they got madras in 1639 right now their third important residency which was there in bengal will come into the picture that how they will come to bengal so uh, basically shah suja was the subedar of bengal the story comes from 1651 okay so shah suja he was the subedar of bengal and um, uh, there he allowed english to trade in bengal in return of an annual payment of 3000 rupees okay uh, like if they can pay 3000 rupees an, uh, annually in lieu of all duties means duty free trade would be given to the britishers so they started factories in bengal and they started it in hugli also in 1651 and they started factories in kasim bazar patna raj mahal everywhere they started factories they had privileges of farmans also so the company business was now uh, you know uh, getting very much grown but they had a problem that uh, uh, whenever they used to cross a state they had to pay a local tax okay so everywhere local check posts used to be there so they had to pay custom officers and they were asked to pay the tolls also so that's why they wanted more privileges and that's why they wanted to have some 
you know, fortified settlements at Hooghly also. And uh, they wanted to keep some force also in the Hooghly. And for that, in 1698, they succeeded in getting a permission to buy Zamindari. Zamindari of three villages, Sutanuti, Gobindapura and Kalikat. And these three villages will become the Bengal Presidency, where the eastern seat would be there. So basically, Sutanoti, Gobindpura, Kaligat, from their owners, they got it with the payment of 1,200 rupees. And they, you know, fortified it. They named it Fort William in the year 1700. And then it became the seat of eastern presidency, which is Calcutta. And Sir Charles Eyre was the first president of Fort William, which you need to remember for exam. Because they asked these kind of factual things uh, in exam in prelims very directly. That's why it is very important to remember. Okay? Just try to remember this one. Now, what will happen that uh, once they got so many rights and privileges, they initiated their uh, you know, trading uh, contracts with later Mughals. So there was a later Mughal, Farooq Sihar. He was having uh, a problem near his thighs and he needed a surgery. But there was no good surgeon or doctor in India who could help him. So he was going through a lot of pain. But Britishers with their surgeons helped Farooq Sihar to get out of that pain and cure that disease. And that's why Farooq Sihar was very, very happy. With this happiness, he gave a golden uh, farman, which is known as a Magna Carta, to the Britishers, in which they got duty-free trading rights in Hyderabad, in Bengal, and uh, in Surat also. So that is the Magna Carta, which was in 1717. So just remember that, uh, you know, they got some permissions. So uh, in 1715, basically, an English mission led by John Sermon came to the court of Mughal Emperor Farooq Siyar and he gave Magna Carta, okay, where they will get duty-free trading rights in Bengal, Surat and Hyderabad, okay, in Gujarat also. So many privileges came and uh, by the time of 1717, you will see that they would be rising with an immense power. Okay, so in Bengal, uh, it was said that companies, imports and exports were exempted from any additional custom duties like uh, the way they had to pay tolls and uh, you know uh, to cross any check post they had to pay ag again money again and again so that was now exempted and uh, only one annual payment of 3000 rupees was given there it was settled as earlier they were permitted to issue dastaks also dastak is passes okay passes which is a free pass in case you want to cross any state uh, you can just go by showing this pass and no money would be taken by you uh, no tax needs to be paid and this problem is there that they started selling these dustaks illegally and they used to do their private trades also Britishers started doing many of the British officers and uh, you know their people they they started their own private business so they so using uh, they started using these passes selling it to indians also sometimes so this led to a very huge level of economic drain in bengal okay company was permitted to rent more lands in calcutta in hyderabad also company retained its existing privileges of freedom of doing the duty free trade and uh, in surat also only a 10000 rupees of annual payment was fixed and they were exempted from all the duties in surat also in bombay also they were you know uh, having their own minting uh, areas where they used to mint their own money their coins were now in circulation in the entire mughal area so yes uh, you know you need to remember the point of the stuck you need to import uh, remember that they got more lands in, uh, on rent and in hyderabad also they had all the privileges only the prevailing rent of madras they were paying in surat 10000 rupees of annual payment was fixed and they minted their own coins in, uh, at bombay and they were to have uh, currency throughout the Mughal Empire. So this is a big thing that now their coins are getting minted and it would be circulation uh, in the circulation in the country. So it's a big victory for them. Fine. Now 
uh, we will see the anglo french rivalry which is also known as carnatic wars before we discuss carnatic wars you need to understand what is carnatic okay so first of all this area is known as carnatic okay this is carnatic and uh, second is here in this area pondicherry is here and madras is here pondicherry was a french settlement and madras is a english settlement these two settlements are very very important and for madras britishers will fight for pondicherry french will fight so you need to understand the uh, location pondicherry here okay why pondicherry is so important and how the pondicherry will come under the control of french okay so before we begin with the french dominance i hope you understood the rise of english we, we will discuss more about the british conquest anglo maratha war anglo sikh war in the next class but i just wanted to discuss the east india company and their rise with you okay fine okay so as we have discussed the uh, point related to the uh, uh, english uh, we have completed dutch we have completed uh, portuguese we completed the discussion on english now we are coming to french so french french east india company it was established by jean cobert in 1664 ad jean cobert was the finance minister of france okay and he got 50 years of monopoly on french to trade in india okay so uh, jean cobert is a very important person which you need to remember and if we talk about pondicherry he took the charge of pondicherry in 1674 okay francis martin developed it as a place of importance and it was a very strong hold of french in india this is pondicherry here and you can see it is very near to madras so there is a fight for madras and pondicherry so just remember that he was a finance minister jean cobert was a finance minister of louis 14 okay if you remember uh, the french revolution there was louis 16 during the french revolution so this is louis 14 right so louis 14 laid the foundation of campin des indes orientales this is the name of french east india company name of french east india company so initially they started their journey with pondicherry uh they developed their headquarter in pondicherry and it was granted to francis martin who was the director of masuli patnam factory by uh, via kondapuram governor sher khan lodi in 1673 so from there only uh, you know the rise got started when uh, you know martin got pondicherry in his headquarter control and made it the french headquarter right now if we talk about the clash Uh, between french and english it is for what there are many reasons first of all commercial interests is there and political developments were going on in the india uh, and of course in south india so they both wanted to claim on the lands and of course uh, english could do anything for madras and french could do anything for pondicherry and that's why it led to the carnatic wars Now the question is why do we call it Carnatic Wars? What is the meaning of Carnatic? First of all, see, Carnatic means the region, and the capital of Carnatic was in Arcot. Anwaruddin was the Nawab of Arcot. Okay, but he was having this as a very disputed, uh, you know, post. And Chanda Sahib used to claim the uh, throne of Arcot against Anwaruddin. So now what? english and french will do they will decide to uh, get indulged in the internal politics of india to maximize their profit and make gains in a very political way so this is the starting from trade to territory where they will decide to get some political powers in india so that they can increase their profit okay political powers are not there to Uh, you know control things in a very political way it is just to have a dominance okay it's just to create a nuisance against the 
another European power. Fine. So, uh, first of all, I want to discuss something about the area of Carnatic. Then I'll discuss the first, second, and third Carnatic wars with you. We had a very nice map. Yes. This is the area of Carnatic, and this is the area for the Nizam of Hyderabad. Okay, so this area of Carnatic is the part of Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. The capital was in Arcot. Okay, the founder was Sadatullah Khan. Okay, Sadatullah Khan. After Sadatullah Khan, Dost Ali became the Nawab of Karnatik. After Dost Ali, this region came in a dispute. It was a dispute between Anwaruddin and Chanda Sahib. Anwaruddin and Chanda. Sahib. Okay. Anwaruddin and Chana, Chanda Sahib. Now, why the clash is there? Basically, Chanda Sahib was the son-in-law of Dost Ali. And Anwaruddin was the Nawab of Karnatic as per Mughals. Because Mughals used to support Anwaruddin. You know that if Mughals are supporting Anwaruddin, then English will also support Anwaruddin. Now, English are supporting Anwaruddin. That's why Chanda Sahib got the support from French. Because Britishers and French wanted to be superpowers. And they were already fighting in the world. If you will read the world history, you will see that Britishers and French always they were against each other. Wherever Britishers used to go, French used to follow. It started with the American Revolution. When Britishers captured the American, uh, you know, areas and colonies in America, and when Americans wanted independence, so when Americans started fighting against Britishers, French helped Americans. French drained their wealth. They gave a lot of money. They spent a lot of money on the American Revolution. Why? Just to tarnish the image of Britain, just to defeat Britishers, just to downgrade Britishers. French used to do it again and again. Even there was a war going on. It was a war of succession in Austria that who will become the ruler of Austria. So in Austria also, Britishers had their own candidates and French had their own candidates. So the Austrian war of succession became the first Carnatic war in India. Let's say that you have two friends, but uh, you know these two people are always fighting. So if they'll come to your house, they will fight in your house also. As Britishers and French, they were fighting already in the world everywhere. So when they came to India, and when they are so near, like Madras and Pondicherry is so near, they started fighting in India also. And that's why the first Carnatic War happened. Okay. In this area, we have two major ports, Madras and Pondicherry. Okay, Madras is the British settlement, Pondicherry is the French settlement. Okay, Madras and Pondicherry. For which they will start the fight. Clear? Now, there are three Carnatic Wars. In the first Carnatic War, which is also known as the Battle of St. Thom, this was an extension of Austrian War of Succession, where Britishers and French had their own supportive candidates. But here what happened, to start the war, they just wanted to, you know, have a clash or a small fight. Okay. In Pondicherry, the governor was Duplay. Duplay was the French governor in Pondicherry. Okay. 
what they did is their ships were drawn by britishers so just to you know take revenge they seized madras when duplay seized madras britishers complained about it to anwaruddin who was the nawab of karnataka anwaruddin wanted duplay to go out of madras but duplay rejected that's why war happened in this war anwaruddin was defeated but not killed he was defeated in the first karnataka war but but this defeat of anwaruddin is the defeat of english because britishers only asked anwaruddin to help right so in this battle of saint thom or the first carnatic war what happened the madras was seized by the french duplay duplay was the french governor he was not going out he defeated anwaruddin and this defeat is not just defeat of anwaruddin it is the defeat of english and this defeat also exposed the weakness of india it exposed that how indian armies are so weak that indian rulers are not able to control anything in india and a small european army can defeat a big indian army very very easily so india was exposed you can say india indian weakness was exposed with the defeat of anwaruddin okay anwaruddin remember i hope you understood the first carnatic war if you understood the first one then only you will get to know the second carnatic war so in the first carnatic war it's just an extension of anglo french rivalry in europe which is the austrian war of succession that who will become the king of austria where british and french had their own candidates and it ended with the treaty of aix la chapelle in 1748 in which british and french came to peace that they will not fight anymore and then they decided to exchange some territories in north america and madras was returned to britishers back in india and ultimately indian weakness was exposed because anwaruddin was defeated by duplay so duplay understood that these indian armies are of no use and indian rulers are having no power and strategy at all so in the second carnatic war next year 1749 to 54 you will see that duplay will make a triple alliance why because see i have already discussed this with you that anwaruddin was already having a challenge against chanda sahib right chanda sahib wanted to become the nawab of carnatic he was son in law of dost ali right but chanda sahib was not able to do so because he was already in you know uh, uh you know in, in in internal rivalry and he was not supported by anyone so chanda sahib with the french support with the support of duple and the nizam of hyderabad will kill anwaruddin okay so who was the nizam of hyderabad muzaffar jung muzaffar jung was the nawab of hyderabad so they all will what they will do in the second carnatic war they will kill anwaruddin anwaruddin was killed in the second carnatic war which is also known as the battle of ambur in which muzaffar jung chanda sahib and duplay they made a triple alliance to kill anwaruddin after killing anwaruddin now we have only one candidate who can become the nawab of our court chanda sahib so this defeat is again a defeat of english right it's not a defeat of anwaruddin it's a defeat of english because english used to support anwaruddin right now chanda sahib will become the nawab of carnatic and he will start ruling the question is why the nizam of hyderabad muzaffar jung came here basically muzaffar jung in hyderabad was also having a dispute as a nawab okay he was the uh, nawab but he was challenged by nasir jung okay 
that's why in hyderabad also some internal family struggles were going on nasir jung was supported by english and that's why muzaffar jung in hyderabad was supported by the britishers right now this triple alliance when they killed uh, anwaruddin in the second battle uh, everyone was very unhappy britishers thought that this is the last stage of english rule and they won't be able to control anything in south india Dupley got 80 villages from Chanda Sahib as a reward after the Second Carnatic War, but there was an arrival. New episode, episode of Robert Clive. So Robert Clive arrived here in this scenario after Second Carnatic War, and he said that why are you guys so unhappy? If Anwar Uddin is killed, no problem. We are having his son. We can declare his son as the new. nawab of carnatic right so now they decided that mohammad ali was there that we will you know decide that anwar uddin's uh, son is there so son will become the nawab not chanda sahib okay to kill chanda sahib robert clive you know he just had a mindset that he can have a small uh, episode in which mohammad ali would be declared as the new king okay so when he decided you know when robert clive decided to make mohammad ali new king mohammad ali is the son of anwaruddin okay he saw that he was hiding in the fort of tiruchi mohammad ali was hiding why because he knew that my father is killed so uh, they can kill me also any time mohammad ali was so fearful that he was hiding in the fort of tiruchi outside the fort of tiruchi chanda sahib was waiting chanda sahib was just waiting mohammad ali to come out so that he could kill mohammad ali britishers were also waiting for mohammad ali to come out because they wanted to declare mohammad ali as the new nawab but chanda sahib was not moving from the gate okay he was just waiting to kill mohammad ali outside the fort of tiruchi so what robert clive did he knew that uh, you know um pondicherry is so important and madras is so important so he created an episode this was the mindset of britishers and to kill chanda sahib he took help okay he took help uh, from the raja of tanjore so what he did that uh, robert clive attacked arcot arcot was the capital of uh, carnatic right so arcot is chanda sahib's capital so when robert clive attacked arcot hearing this that arcot is in danger chanda sahib was going to save the arcot so when he was on his way raja of tanjore killed chanda sahib and chanda sahib was now killed uh, why raja of tanjore killed chanda sahib because raja of tanjore uh, had some internal disputes with the carnatics nawab and raja of tanjore was in friendship with english so english used their neighboring friends to kill chanda sahib now in the end you will see by the third carnatic war all the indian rulers local rulers were dead and english people they bribed french government and asked uh, you know duple to be transferred out of india so french removed duple uh, from india which is a very big blunder and yes of course it was a big blunder because after that only french lost their power in india and then you will see that english will rise to their power so third carnatic war is also known as the battle of vandi wash it was in 1760 to 61 okay it was again a struggle of europe only which came in india by the treaty of paris uh, uh, again britishers and french came into the peace in 1763 the french were allowed to use the indian settlements for commercial purpose only and the fortifications of settlements were banned the uh, french uh, you know they were only uh, able to secure few areas like in pondicherry and uh, in yanam mahe in few of these small territories only but they were only for the commercial activities not for anything else okay in this third carnatic war you just need to remember that ir kut was the uh english governor who defeated count de lely okay lely was defeated lely was the french from the french side we had lely who was defeated by the english governor irkut in the 
third carnatic war okay in the third carnatic war that's it in short you just need to remember this much only uh, so there are so many details and complexities in the book ignore that understand the explanation understand these three important uh, you know pointers and then it would be fine for you you don't need to remember different unnecessary points again and again okay is there any doubt please let me know if there is any doubt fine so lely was defeated lely was the french governor who was defeated who was taken into the prison fine so i hope that everything is clear and now we can end the session for today we have completed the discussion i think just one point is there which is about danes and then we will be able to end it i have already discussed that from where danes came right danes were from denmark just remember that uh, they established uh, their uh, their, uh, their company the danes east india company was established in 16 16 within 4 years they were able to start their factory they started from trenkwa bar trenkwa bar is here you can see in the map okay where uh, they started their first factory and uh, they had a factory in sirampur also okay at which is near calcutta and uh, you know these danish factories are not very significant because they were not doing good in trade and they were more uh, you know interested in missionary activities they wanted to spread christianity so they had no commercial or profit making mindset so in 1845 insignificant danish factories were sold to the british government and they just went away okay so the danes are better known for their missionary activities uh you know more activities than their co co commerce so just um, remember this much about danes other points are not important just remember danes are from denmark they came here but they sold everything to the english and went away that's it nothing else is important fine so we have completed french portuguese danes dutch english all the east india companies everything is clear in case you have any doubt in case there is anything you want to discuss you can discuss here also you can see in chandranagar also uh, they had factory danes had the factory but these factories were sold to the english in the end so that's why it's not important fine so i hope guys this class was useful for you thank you so much for coming thank you so much for watching i'll end the session here in case you have any doubts you can discuss that with, uh, that with me live and i'll be able to see it so please comment down if you need to discuss anything yes yes we will continue this series and before prelims only we will cover it okay don't worry fine please share it with your uh, friends guys please share and please like the video thank you so much for coming see you then take care bye bye